So the new MacBooks, they really are a great all-around package. You kind of can't go, oh, God, Dad, you, you scared me there. Ah, uh, this thing is so creepy. It's always popping up. Oh, man, I forgot about this. The trash can Mac Pro. This guy, uh, it's just been a thorn in Apple's side for eight years now, and it's still not going away. These things are still out here. They're still overpriced. And in today's video, I want to show you guys why this thing is just completely dead. Today's video is sponsored by my friends over at iFixit, and let me tell you, I use them quite a bit when working on this particular Trash Can Mac Pro. This is the most powerful one that money can buy, or that you can build, which is what I did. And I did all of it with the help of the iFixit ProTech Toolkit and iFixit's repair guides, which offer a complete detailed breakdown on every single thing that you would want to do to upgrade, repair, or modify your Trash Can Mac Pro. So check out the links in the description below for resources on how to do all of that. You will be able to completely disassemble this machine and reassemble it if you so choose to. Or you could leave it disassembled out of rage and spite. So this is my Trash Can Mac Pro and it is the best that money can buy. It has every single upgrade that you could think of. It's got the 12 core Xeon processor. It has 128 gigabytes of DDR3 ECC RAM. It has the pretty hard to find Radeon Fire Pro D700 dual graphics, and it has a two terabyte SSD. So this thing is pretty crazy. In fact, when this Mac Pro came out in 2013, you couldn't even configure it with these specs. You couldn't go above 64 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte of storage. So this would have been $10,000 plus another several thousand dollars in upgrades back in 2013, but my particular one was only bought like four or five years ago, so it's not even really that old. Apple sold this generation of Mac Pro for a whopping six years, and in those six years, they changed absolutely nothing at all. And so even though this is an eight-year-old machine, this is only a five-year-old machine, and some are only two years old. It's kind of sad, isn't it? I don't know who was buying these things in 2019, but some people did. And as a result of that, if you go on eBay, the prices for these don't make any sense whatsoever. You might be surprised to see that machines in the spec range like mine still fetch upwards of 2,000, almost $3,000 in some cases. And this to me is just shocking. I can't imagine why anyone would spend that type of money on a machine with this kind of age and reputation. But if we really wanna understand why this machine is worthless, we have to explain why it's worth so much, paradoxically. Our engineering team has spent quite a bit of time thinking about the technology available today and what could be possible for the future of a pro desktop. Can't innovate anymore, my ass. <laughs> The processor, graphics, memory storage are all built around a new unified thermal core. Well, the simple answer is that as powerful Mac desktops go, there just aren't that many options out there. You can have the Trash Can Mac Pro, you can get a 2018 Mac Mini, an M1 Mac Mini, or the 2019 $6,000 Mac Pro. That's only four options. And the Intel Mac Mini, I would avoid. The $6,000 Mac Pro, that's its own thing. So you either buy an M1 Mac Mini or you buy this. Those are your only two like desktop options. What the heck? What's that all about, Apple? Perhaps the reason why these things have held their value so well is that there's literally just nothing else to buy. But that brings us over to the other side of the frame here. Why I've had this MacBook open the entire time because now the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips are here and well, <laughs> I think we need to do a little bit of comparison to see how this $10,000 plus Mac Pro holds up 
to these chips. So to find out, I ran the same benchmarks that I ran when testing out the new MacBooks on the Mac Pro over here. <laughs> yeah. Starting with Cinebench R23, the 12 core Mac Pro is beaten even by the base model 14 inch and by a pretty noticeable margin. And then if you look over at Cinebench single core, it's not even remotely close. 678 compared to 1532, that's unbelievable. Moving over to Geekbench 5 in the multi-core test, once again, just absolutely annihilated by everything. Same thing in the single core. Same thing even in Geekbench 5 Compute. Remember, we've got dual D700 graphics cards in the Mac Pro over here. They're even beaten by the base 14 core GPU in the 14 inch MacBook Pro, and that applies in real world applications as well. If we look at Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we only got 35 FPS on the D700 Mac Pro, whereas even the base model 14 core was able to get 51 FPS. In some other graphics benchmarks like GFX Bench, the Aztec high tier saw once again absolute annihilation of the D700, which got strangely even worse in GFX Bench Manhattan. This thing scored absolutely shockingly low. Same thing in T-Rex. It was, it, it was like ridiculous how much the new stuff is beating this thing by. Same over in Basemark GPU, 2248. It was half the score of the 14 core GPU in the 14 inch MacBook Pro. I mean, it's just, ridiculous how anemic this thing is. And this is a metal supported GPU, right? So it's not like we're running on like an outdated API. It It's just old and bad. If we jump back in and take a look at some real world applications, this is where we can really see the difference that optimization makes because Apple has always been about optimizing their hardware. When this thing came out in 2013, it was quite well optimized, and that was one of its strong suits. But today, optimization with M1 Max and M1 Pro is just completely on a different level. So to start, we ran some tests in Blender. In the longer classroom test, the 14-inch base model handily beat by almost 30 seconds the 12 core, and then the higher spec M1 Maxes just absolutely smoked it by multiple minutes. Weirdly though, in the BMW render, this was the only test where the 12 core Mac Pro beat any of the new MacBooks at all. It beat the 14 inch base model by just five seconds. But Blender isn't really all that well optimized for Apple Silicon, so that result probably isn't gonna stay the same for very long. In the Blender BMW GPU test, well, it wasn't even close. Once again, the Mac Pro got absolutely stomped on, and the same thing happened in the Blender Mr. Elephant EV render. Absolute annihilation. Moving over to Final Cut Pro in the render of our 4K 10-bit 60 FPS clip, I mean, I have no words. This is what happens when you build in dedicated media encoder and decoders into your processors. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And the same thing in the export. It's it's a completely different world. And guys, it just it just keeps going. You want to see you want to see DaVinci Resolve? You want to see what DaVinci Resolve looked like? Take a look. Oh no. Why? You were $10,000 two years ago. I almost feel bad for it, you know? It's it's trying its hardest. You can feel all the hot air coming out the top. It it, it really wants to do good. It's like, did I did I do it? Did I did I make it work? And and then you're just like, no, buddy, you're not even close. So when you look at these numbers overall, we had one test where the the absolute loaded, most powerful Mac Pro you can build beat the base model 14 inch, the least powerful one that you could buy. Okay, that is really, really interesting. Now I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, Luke, what are you doing here? Why are you comparing a desktop to a laptop? You said yourself, the big issue is that there's not a lot of other desktop competition. If you wanna have something on your desk plugged into a monitor with a mouse and keyboard, and you're not interested in purchasing a laptop. 
Now, the reason why this, I think, is a really good comparison is because these chips are almost guaranteed to be coming to a Mac Mini near you very soon. And when that does happen, I will be so unbelievably happy. But to me, the craziest part right now is how wholly, completely, and absolutely demolished this $10,000 computer was. And yeah, I get that it's an eight-year-old architecture, so it's not exactly cutting edge, but mine's only five years old, and these are still selling for $2,000 to $3,000 even today. So they're more expensive used than a new base model 14-inch MacBook Pro that just creamed it in every test except for one. And that test was basically a tie anyway. It's crazy to think about how much power is packed into these new MacBooks that you would have had to pay so much money for just a couple of years ago. And it's not just about the power, it's also about the power consumption. This thing uses about 437 watts if you combine the power used from the CPU and then both GPUs. 437 watts. This guy, it's about 60 for an M1 Pro and it just absolutely smoked it. Smoked it with 60 watts. You're trash. Apple ironically ended up boxing themselves into a cylindrical corner. It just became harder and harder to modernize this machine as time went on, so Apple just left it for six years. And in doing that, they abandoned a pretty big and pretty compelling chunk of the market, that mid-range prosumer desktop. But fortunately, the good news for us is that it doesn't seem like it's gonna be like that for very long. These new MacBook Pros have come out and have absolutely shit all over the trash can Mac Pro, and it seems pretty likely that it's not gonna be long now before we get these chips in a Mac Mini, and that, that's just like basically perfection in my book. I will be buying one of those things in a heartbeat. Let me know if you are as excited as I am for an M1 Pro or an M1 Max powered Mac Mini. Wow, that's a mouthful. Oh my goodness. Again, I'm sorry if I sound a little weird in this video. I'm still recovering from some sickness, but I gotta get some videos out there for you guys. As usual, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think about the Trash Can Mac Pro in 2021, and I will see you guys in the next video.